Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, as you know, I'm Dave Tilbrook from the Department of Fundamental and Theoretical Physics at uh, Australian National University, and I'm hosting this series of talks. As everyone is probably aware, this is uh, part of an ongoing series of, of seminars on, that are presented on behalf of the Theoretical Physics Group of the Australian Institute of Physics. If you're interested in theoretical physics and you'd like to be kept up to date automatically about all matters theoretical physics going on in Australia, you are very welcome to join the group. Um, there's a link in the advertisement for this talk for that purpose, that should make it easy to, to do. Um, this talk, as with previous talks, will be uh, updated to the AOP YouTube channel within a few days, so it'll be available for you to view again if you would uh, like to. Um, I almost always have to go back and look at it couple more times look at the talks a couple more times to really digest everything that people have said so that's why it's uh, can be very valuable um as i mentioned this forms part of a series of seminars being held this year which uh, cover a broad range of topics in theoretical physics actually this is the third year for this uh, this um format uh, most recently we heard an excellent talk from uh, professor shader epek from the Theoretical Particle Physics Group at Carlton University in Ottawa on the matter-antimatter symmetry problem. That was a great talk. And you'll find that on the AIP YouTube channel as well, if you want to see that. Today's speaker is Professor Xavier Kelme from the School of Mathematical and Theoretical Sciences at the University of Sussex in the United Kingdom, uh, having held postdoctoral positions at the California Institute of Technology University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, Free University of Brussels, University of Oregon, and the Catholic University of Louvain. Throughout that time, Xavier has worked on a number of areas of theoretical physics and has made contributions to, excuse me, such things as non-community of gauge theories. He's also made significant contributions to topics such as the existence of a minimal length in nature based on arguments from black hole physics and quantum metrology, which also would have been a fascinating talk just on its own. Um, at the University of Sussex, he's worked on topics in quantum gravity and the quantum properties of black hole and other astrophysical objects, as well as uh, quantum properties of the early, early universe. I think you've done some work on that, Xavier. Mm -hmm. And most recently, uh, and most relevantly for tonight's talk, he's developed uh, ways of building models that are um, theory theory independent based well uh, based uh, that are model independent based on effective field theory, which of course is a technique from standard quantum field theory. So it's going to be very interesting. Uh, most of us undoubtedly will have heard of the black hole information paradox. This is the hypothesized loss of information which would occur if a black hole is uh, regarded as being fully characterized by its mass, mass electric charge and angular momentum in the usual way, excuse me, and which then uh, evaporates by Hawking radiation. The paradox is the apparent annihilation of information, which is initially, which was initially encoded by the states of the matter that was captured by the black hole. I think that's a reasonable qualitative explanation. Um, Although it, this hasn't always been the case, I think it's probably true to say, although I invite Xavier to correct me if this is wrong, um, that these days most people working on this problem generally believe that by some means or another, information is preserved during the black hole evaporation. Um, in any case, this is going to be a very interesting seminar and it's a great opportunity for me to introduce Xavier with his talk entitled Quantum Hair and Information Paradox. Thanks, Xavier. Over to you. Well, thank you very much for the invitation and a very nice introduction. It's really my pleasure um, to, to be able to talk to you about this, this um, work we've done in recent years. Uh, first of all, thanks a lot for staying up late at work. And I appreciate that uh, you try to make it as convenient for me as possible by picking this time. So I'm going to be talking about work that I've done mainly with Steve Shu, who's a you know long-standing uh, collaborator of mine, um, but with some significant inputs from on different papers by Roberto Casadillo from the University of Bologna, Volker Kuypers, who was a PhD student um, in my group, 
who's absolutely fantastic. If you have a job, a tenure job, look into him. He's really a very good guy. And as a recent PhD student who promises to be just as good, uh, Marco Sebastianuti. So who got involved in the last paper that I've been mentioning. So, oh, how do I swap slides here? Here's a take home message. If for whatever reason I can't get um, through all my slides. So my claim is that we have identified quantum gravitational corrections to the external metric of compact objects. And these corrections contain information about the interior of the metric. So um, this is what we call a quantum hair, and it's a new form of quantum hair that as far as I know, hadn't been identified before. We have then generalized the results that were obtained for a star to, to black holes. And um, we've explained in terms of um, generic arguments why these uh, quantum hair must also apply. So not just this calculation I will be showing to you in a few minutes. And this quantum hair opens up the door to a new solution to the information paradox and it's to specifically explain how information is conveyed to, 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 the, to the radiation and how information escapes. And I think the statement you made was perfectly true. Most people, I think maybe outside of the GR community, we still have some people wondering whether information could be violated by black holes, but most people working specifically on the topic believe it will be um, restored. Um, the question is how and whether you need things like string theory or something like this. So the UV complete theory of gravity, which I claim you don't need to know anything about. So <laughs> basically, we're going to be using effective field theory techniques to do calculations of quantum gravity. And I will show you how these um, calculations can be used or the, these techniques can be used to do calculations to show how Hawking's amplitudes are corrected. And basically the punchline is that with these simple techniques, we're able to show that the, the spectrum for, for the black hole differs from that of a black body and it just contains information. So here's the outline for the talk. I will very briefly tell you about these effective field theory methods and how they apply to quantum gravity. I will show you a little calculation or a little application of these techniques to stars. And um, that was the first hint of this quantum hair. So we're gonna get hairy stars and, and black holes. And again, I won't have time to get into too much details. The calculations are very simple. I mean, if you're in really interested, you can follow them um, you know, step-by-step step, then the paper. But I want to give you the punchline and the ideas. And that's how we got intuition to define the quantum states of the gravity field um, and then get into the black hole radiation and evolution. And then finally, I will present to you, of, you know, some of our most recent results where we explicitly revisit Hawking's calculation um, using the techniques that we've discussed, um, showing how the amplitude and the spectrum are modified by quantum gravity. And I'll get to the conclusions. By the way, I cannot see the chat, as you know, using Zoom. So if there are questions, I'm very happy for you to interrupt me at any time during the talk. Feel free to, to, to just uh, let me know. Um, and also, I hope I'll be clear. It's a bit early for me. I'm not a morning person, so apologies for that in advance. So the technique we're using is the unique effective action. And this is really an old topic. So it goes back to the late 70s um, and 80s. Um, basically, the work of uh, Bavinsky and Vinkovinsky. Um, so the idea is that you consider uh, GR as the correct low energy limit of whatever your UV complete theory of quantum gravity might be. So it's a very minor assumption. <coughs> Sorry. And you integrate out the, the fluctuations of the graviton and any other matter field you may, may want to, to get rid of. That depends on the physical problem you have at hand. And what you obtain is a derivative expansion of your effective action. Now, the key word here is unique. I, I don't have too much time again to give you more details, but one of the major issues when you derive an effective action, as you may know, is that the Wilson coefficients 
may become gauge dependent. That's a very well-known fact. And so there's a way around that. Again, that's um, basically this technique developed by Bavinsky and Vinkovinsky. And that's why the unique, the effective action is unique. The Wilson coefficients are, are guaranteed to be gauge invariant and you have a well-defined theory to work with. So integrating out the fluctuation of the graviton, you're left with a purely classical field theory. And so you recover your Einstein Hilbert Einstein action. If you have scalars in the game, you will have this other dimension four operator. So it's important because psi is dimensionless. So it might be some fundamental constant from that point of view. I don't have anything new to say about the cosmological constant. And you get what I would call local part of the action. So things like C1 R squared, C2 R mu R mu. There's a similar term, the Riemann term that you can, you can basically reformulate in terms of the R squared R mu R mu term using the Gauss-Bonnet identity. You have these terms which are total derivatives that don't matter. And you would have higher terms in your derivative expansion, but we're gonna truncate the action here. And again, it's a derivative expansion. And as long as you get, stay far away from uh, singularities, curvature for all purposes in our universe are small. And so you can trust these techniques. And then because you integrate out massless degrees of freedom with the graviton, you're going to get these terms P1R log box over mu1 squared. So mu1 is some normalization scale. You have similar terms for the, the Ricci tensor term and the Riemann tensor term, but I've shown there are ways to express this term into these first two terms, again, using some non-local formulation of the Gauss-Bonnet in a derivative expansion as well. So in the curvature expansion. So you can also get rid of this term in favor of these two terms, and that makes life much easier when you do calculations. So anyway, um, I haven't solved anything here. So GR is still non-normalizable. Um, so in that sense, I cannot make predictions for C1, C2, C4. C3 would be the coefficient of the Riemann tensor squared. But we've gained something. And what we've gained is that the B1, B2, and B3 are calculable from first principles. They depend on the number of fields you have integrated out. So for a scalar field, that's the value of B1 you get, B2 and B3. And for graviton, which is what we're interested in, really in this case, those are the values we're getting. So if you have an observable that depends only on the um, non-local part of the action, um, you have an actual prediction of quantum gravity that doesn't depend on the UV complete theory. So that's why this is an interesting technique. Now, the term non-local may scare you. It may sound like we're doing something crazy or goofy or who knows what. Um, it's it's just an unfortunate term that comes from the fact that you are <laughs> integrating out massless degrees of freedom. So I want to emphasize that this is all very conservative. There's nothing, we don't introduce non-local operators in the sense that some people do. We're simply integrating out the graviton that is massless. All we assume is that GR is the correct energy limit. We don't assume anything beyond this. And we have a purely classical field theory once we have integrated all the, fluctu the fluctuations. And again, the price to pay for, for this uh, approach is that you do not know the Wilson coefficients of the local part of the action. You cannot calculate them from first principle. The, what you could do if you want to, to, to so we would have to, have to measure them. Obviously, their effects are very tiny. Um, or if you know you uh, complete theory, so you can, for taking string theory, you could match your effective action to, to your preferred string, string model and get the values of C1, C2 that, for example, would depend on how you compactify your extra dimension. That's something we've looked into. So we have basically a completely coherent and um, well-defined approach to calculations quantum gravity. Now, let me take you the, any remaining worry you may have about the, the log box. The log box is actually just a distribution. And because we will be working in a curvature expansion, as I've explained, and for all practical purposes, this is all we ever need in our universe, really, and unless you try to get really to, to quantum black holes, so that, that is Planck mass black holes, or if you get close to singularity, um, we can work with L in the approximation will be 
working for this log as a distribution in, in flat space time. And it's basically the Fourier transform of the log minus P squared that you would get from a Fermi diagram if you were to, to calculate these diagrams, for example. And you can calculate this, this distribution explicitly depending on the space time you're having. And that's what you get for flat space time, for example. I mean, again, I'm not going to get into the description of this object. I just want to show you that it's not some crazy beast. And in the end of the day, the calculations are fairly simple because what you have to calculate are convolutions of these functions L over Riemann scalars, tensors, sorry, Ricci scalars, or Ricci tensors, or Riemann uh, tensors. That's all you have to do. So here's this example, this little calculation that gave us intuition for, for the remaining of the, the work we've done after that. So we start from the unique effective action and we're gonna start with a very simple um, system. So we take a static star, so a, a dust ball, and we assume that there's a constant density inside uh, the, the ball, so up to Rs, and it's empty outside. So from the effective action that I've shown you, you vary it with respect to the metric. You obviously get the first term, which is your Einstein's equations. And you're going to get two bits here that we call the local H and non-local H that basically come from the non-local part and local part of the action that um, I've described to you a few minutes ago. So the way we deal the problem is that uh, we look for problems that have an analytical solution that is known um, in the case of uh, GR. So for this specific matter distribution, we know that inside the, 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 the star, we have the interior Schwarzschild metric, which is given by this object. And the mass here is nothing but the Misner Schwarzschild mass. Outside, um, you have the usual Schwarzschild uh, solution. And again, that's a consequence of the Birkhoff theorem. And I'll, I'll comment on that in a second. So what you can do is take your classical metric, you plug it into, and you, you, you look for a, a correction, a quantum correction to that metric. You plug the thing into your differential equation. And again, after some simple, maybe tedious, but simple calculations, you will get uh, the quantum correction outside the star. And the bit which is interesting is first of all, well, that's the GR part, but you recover, or rather you, you gain this, correction that depends only on the non-local part of the action. So they, so those are the calculable pieces, alpha, beta, and gamma. They don't depend on the C. Um, I've introduced the elder Planck lens to make things uh, you know, into perspective. So what's interesting here is to look at this term. So there's an R squared, R, R squared here. So it's R to minus five term. And this term is proportional to G squared M Rs minus three. So that's a quantum gravitational correction that is proportional to density of the source object. So that's very interesting because that means being outside the star, you're able, in principle, if you could measure these corrections, um, you're, you're able to, to, to determine that uh, what was, uh, what's in the star basically from outside. Now, this is a violation of Birkhoff theorem. And that's, you know, it's... Uh, it, it's clear that Birkhoff is not going to hold in quantum gravity uh, because you have a higher order differential equation. And so that opens up the door to a lot of interesting things. You can revisit a lot of the calculations people have done or the, the implications people had in mind of the Birkhoff theorem. They won't hold in quantum gravity. So what do we do with this? Well, so that's not yet quite good enough to convince ourselves that if we were to think of the stars collapsing, that we would form a black hole because it's a static object. So recently, we revisited this issue and we considered instead of a static dust ball, we took the Oppenheimer Snyder collapse model, for which, as you know, there's a classical solution in GR. And so we, we calculated this uh, quantum correction. So there, the calculations are more tedious because your uh, distribution is now space and time dependent, and you have to be careful. <laughs> with what time is, and, uh, and again, I, I will spare you the details, but what happens for the quantum hair essentially is that you can replace Rs by Rs of T. So that's uh, um, very interesting because then you have a dynamical system 
and you can basically show that the distant observer that is far away from the, the star can track this r to the minus five correction in principle during the totality of the collapse. And at some point, your star is going to reach, or the radius of the star is going to reach the, the 2 GNM, um, so the Schwarzschild radius uh, condition, and you will form a closed trap surface, or you can use a hook conjecture, whichever you prefer, but you, you can argue from a black hole. And that this correction, um, again, is persisting throughout the process. Now, all of these things, it's really important to, to realize that the curvature of the system remains really, really small. So you can trust these techniques. The only curvature invariant, or the, the only place of the curvature invariance, um, the Kretschmann scalar becomes large is if you look at r equals zero. But otherwise, as long as you're away from r equals zero, which we do, and as long as you keep your black hole large, so that it, some things like 10 times larger than the Planck mass, the curvature is weak and you can trust these techniques. So the corrections contain information about the matter distribution that collapse and they could thus, in principle, give us a way to differentiate between black holes that were formed by different matter distributions. So again, I hope I've convinced you that quantum gravity produces a new kind of hair on black holes. And I will show you how this affects um, Hawking's evaporation. Now, this is a perturbative calculation. Um, and again, it was really something that for us was there more as a motivation for, or so to give us the intuition what's really happening there. So now let me try to give you some um, argument that is in the end of the day, fully independent of this EFT approach. So if you like it, if you like the EFT, great. If you don't, don't worry, because what I'm gonna tell you now doesn't depend on any of the details. It was just a motivation for us. So let me describe to you the asymptotic quantum state of the gravitational field. So we're going to look at a compact source, uh, which uh, is an energy eigenstate, and we're going to assign uh, E as eigenvalue for this eigenstate. So what I want to try to write down is the quantum state for the graviton, which I'm going to call psi g of E. And it must be something that is uh, fully analogous to what we know from a U1 um, vector field, so from QED. So you know that uh, that it would be created by a charge Q. So we can, for in QED, you can write a coherent state as um, exponential Q, integral D3K, uh, Q of K, of k B dagger K. So B dagger are linear combinations of creation operators for the non-propagating modes of the photon. So those are, depending on the gauge, the temporal and longitudinal modes. And this acts on zero. So that's basically very well understood. Now, if you have gravity, um, you would expect that all you have to do is replace Q by the energy eigenvalue of the source. In that case, the modes, the coherent states modes are temporal and longitudinal graviton modes. So what's remarkable here is that um, the asymptotic state in both QED and in quantum gravity are determined by the Gauss law via constraint quantization. Now, there are different ways to argue that this must be this way. Um, there's You could also try to, to use the, the, the double copy uh, relationship, um, which works well. So that's um, something I don't have too much time to discuss again. but. There's a close analogy between uh, these techniques and the statement making this connection between the Gauss law and um, the double copy. So the graviton quantum state, psi g of E, depends on the energy. So you have distinct energy eigenstates of this compact source we're, we're discussing, and each of them has a different graviton quantum state. So if you think of a semi-classical matter configuration, it's a superposition of energy eigenstates that will have a support that is concentrated in some narrow band of energy. So you can write psi as psi, so sum of n, cn, psi n. And psi n are the eigenvalues, sorry, eigenstates with eigenvalues en. So for the graviton, we basically have a superposition state that is psi g, which is a sum of n, cn psi g of e n. Now in QED, the long wavelength photons couple 
to the total charge of the composite object. And in gravity, we have the analogon property that the long wavelength gravitons couple to the energy eigenvalue of the compact object. So what is important here is that the semi-classical compact source produce or sources, sorry, produce external graviton states that are complex position given by psi of g. And basically, this is uh, the star, is, uh, well, the, the two stars examples I've given you before, whether the, the, the static star or the uh, collapsing model are concrete example of this generic or general result. Right, so let me now tell you about the Hawking information paradox. And I will then explain why and how we can address uh, this issue with uh, new material, new ideas. So as you know, the original formulation of the paradox goes back to Hawking. Um, Hawking discovered that black holes are um, emit thermal radiation, so they cannot uh, contain information. And he discovered that black holes radiate uh, radiation, which implies that they would evaporate and at some point they would be gone. And if radiation is thermal, that means information that we need to the black hole is destroyed. So basically you could uh, phrase it this way, black holes would cause pure states to evolve into mixed states. Now that formulation is neat, but we need something that is mathematically a little bit more precise if we want to, to discuss how to specifically address these issues. And the best formulation I'm aware of goes back to Mature. Um, and he's a very smart guy and was very careful in the way he phrases assumptions. And um, basically, as far as, as far as I know, again, it's the best way to discuss the Hawking paradox nowadays. So the reason why his formulation is so powerful is that you can track the entanglement entropy of the radiation. And you consider what he called nice slices. So nice slice is basically a part of space-time where gravity is still very well behaved. There's no issue with gravity. So you take as nice slices as space-like surfaces that intersect both the interior of the black hole and the emitted Hawking radiation. But curvature is very weak. Basically, sorry. Mature claims that because of this, you don't have to worry about quantum gravity, which obviously is a tough problem. So let me review Mature's formulation of the paradox. And I will be using his notation in case you want to have a look at his papers uh, that might make, might make your life easier. So he considers the modes that are outside the horizon and calls them B1, B2, B3, and so on. And those inside the horizon as E1, E2, and so on. So we're talking about Hawking radiation here. So you start from the following picture. Um, you have an initial slice in this uh, foliation you've made that contains only the matter state, so psi m, so basically your black hole, and no quanta, so no radiation, no EI or BI. So you then think of your black hole or of your creation of creating uh, the first pair of Hawking radiation, so E1, B1. And they're now present on that new slide, slide, sorry. And so you can write the state for these new modes uh, in the following ways. You use the occupation number uh, notation. So one of a squared of two, zero, zero, plus one, one. And well, you can easily calculate the entanglement of the state outside the horizon that is given by, again, the, the modes B, B1 with the state inside that we called E1, or rather material called E1. And the entanglement is log two. So then your particles B1 and E1 are going to move away. You have new particles that are Created between E2, and it will form a similar state like this. One with one of a square root of two, zero E2, zero B2, one E2, one B2, and so on. So after n step, what you end up with is a state that looks like that. So it's a tensor product, and that's really the crux of the demonstration here. 
you have at the end state, your psi is given by psi m, so your black hole that has shrunk, times the first pair, the state for the first pair, the state for the second pair, and so on, up to the nth pair. So the bi are entangled with ei and the black hole, and there's an entropy of n time log two after n emissions. So every time you emit a pair of particles of radiation, you get another log two added to, well, you, you, the entanglement grows by log two. And so that's really the, the, the way to understand the, the paradox. So the entropy grows and grows and grows as much as you, I mean, you, the more particles you emit. And once the black hole is gone, so once this psi m is gone, it has evaporated completely. The bi quanta outside are entangled, but there's nothing for them to be entangled with. So that's the cleanest way to discuss or to define the, the paradox. So something funny happened. Sorry, don't know what's going on with my screen. So I can, I've got a bar again on top of my screen. Can you see it or can you, can you see that line here? For me, it's, not, it's a color. Not, no, it's fine for us. It, it's fine. Okay. That's yeah, always we, my worry. We don't <laughs> take that far. Yeah. Yeah. So you have basically a pure state psi M um, that um, has evolved into a state that is not described by a density matrix. So a uh, semic state, basically. So that's the way to, to think of the Hawking paradox at a mature. And again, it's the cleanest way to, 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 to do it. Now, mature is a very smart guy. And he's going to give you the fact that there will be corrections to, to this um, log two coming from quantum gravity. And he knows that these corrections are small. So he calls them epsilon. And he's perfectly right. They're small. And he will tell you, well, um, there are small corrections, but they will only change log two by log two minus epsilon, where minus ep well, the epsilon is minuscule. So I really don't care about it. I don't need to know about quantum gravity. There is this Hawking paradox that's there. Now, um, that's all fine. I'll tell you where it goes wrong, basically, uh, as we go through. So the first thing you have to really keep in mind here is that this formulation is limited by the assumption of a semi-classical space-time background. So you basically have one Penrose diagram that doesn't change with time. Obviously, that's something you may want to worry about because your, your geometry is going to change as you emit particles. So um, basically, this formulation doesn't address the possibility that you have entangle entanglement between the different backgrounds geometry, so the gravitational states. And what I'm going to argue is that black holes or the geometry and the Hawking radiation form a macroscopic superposition. And that's really the key idea there to, to, to go beyond the Tours uh, formulation. So let me now tell you, how am I doing time-wise? I guess another 20, 20 minutes, is that about right? Yep, that's fine. It, yeah. We're not all that time uh, critical, Xavier, so. Okay. Just have whatever you have to, yeah, it's all good. So, uh, let me now recap the key ingredients we have. So we argued that the asymptotic state of the for the graviton of an energy eigenstate source is fixed to leading order by the eigenvalue of the energy, and it can be expressed as a coherent state that depends on this eigenvalue. So there's a very mild and very reasonable assumption here, namely that we don't have uh, accidental energy de degeneracies, so that there's a one-to-one -one map between the graviton states and matter source states. But this is absolutely um, you know, minor because um, of examples we know in many, uh, many, many particle physics, and unless you have Unless you have a, a symmetry, you never have degeneracy. So um, that's the, but I want to be completely honest and you know give you all our assumptions, but I think this is something that is completely safe. We don't have to worry about this. So basically, semi-classical matter source produces an entangled graviton state. So that's the first property we need. And then we've shown you 
first of all, perturbativity with CFT techniques, and then also the generic argument I've given you that the quantum gravitational fluctuations, so for loop of graviton, for example, produce corrections to the long range potential that will go, for example, r to the minus five. And the coefficient of these uh, corrections depend on the internal state of the source. So that again is um, an explicit example of how the graviton quantum state and basically the corresponding semi-classical potential encodes information about the internal stru structure of the black hole. Now, what is really important again to keep in mind is that none of this depends on the short distance physics of the so in quantum gravity. So I, I, I was able to, to make these statements without referring to any UV complete theory of quantum gravity. All I need to assume is that GR is the correct energy limit. So let me now consider black hole evaporation or radiation. So I'm going to put things together. Um, we write the quantum state for the exterior geometry or the exterior metric, whichever you want, it's exactly the, the same thing. You write as psi i as a sum of n, c n, psi g of e n. And that we can think of as a sum of n, c n, uh, uh, g e n. So a g is the geometry, basically, that depends on the, so the exterior metric or the exterior geometry that depends on the energy e n. So I'm not going to write explicitly all the quantum numbers. And I'm going to write, um, choose a compact notation so that we can keep track of uh, the quantum numbers. So here's uh, the notation I'm going to be using. So we think of a black hole that emits one quantum at a time. And there will be n radiation quanta at some point in the final state. So we're going to have R1, R2, R3, and so on, Rn. So that would be our final state. And by Ri, I mean basically a collection of all the quantum number of this radiation. So it's the energy delta I, it's the momenta Pi, it's the spin Si, it's the charge Qi, and so on. So we use this compact notation. So I can define the final state again by giving you R1, R2 up to Rn. I'm going to call alpha the amplitude for emission of the quantum Ri, so alpha E of Ri, from the exterior metric state psi GE. So the black hole has energy E, and do the quantum number of the particle or the radiation is emitted Ri. So clearly to living order, alpha is just the result that Hawking obtained um, some um, 50 years ago. So th that's the, but we're going to get corrections to this. So independently of the work that we have done or, you know, in, in uh, EFTs, um, people have known for a long time that you will get corrections from quantum gravity uh, to alpha. They were just not able to calculate them. There were two types of corrections that you could imagine. Some that would be perturbative, so they would then go as S, where S is the entropy of the black hole to the minus K, or exponential minus S. And exponential minus S would be non-perturbative effects. So that's the worst case scenario, basically, because that means you, the corrections are very tiny. The epsilon of mature are very tiny. And so that for that reason, people felt, well, okay, it's probably, you know, quantum gravity is probably irrelevant. Um, now, what we're shown specifically is that alpha will depend on the internal state of the black hole because of the quantum hair. Now, here's a very important thing to, to realize, and that's one thing that people have um, understood um, in the you know, 2010s. Um, if, even if you have a very small correction to the amplitude, so, or, you know, the, to the entropy, as you wish, to the, the, this epsilon, even if the epsilon is very small. Because you have a lot of particles emitted. And because, again, the, as I will argue, the, the metric will be changing. So it changes every time you emit a particle, the metric changes. So you're summing up a huge um, number of states. If your Hilbert space is large, and this will be the case, 
then basically what you're having is a huge matrix. And when you calculate it trace rho squared, it can be one because this, this, this size, this huge dimensionality of the Hilbert space can be so large that it can compensate even for this tiny exponential minus s. So that's the first counter argument to the epsilon of mature. The, the, the epsilon is small, that's right, but a small number can be compensated because when you're summing correctly over all the, the states, you will have a huge Hilbert space. So you basically have a huge matrix. And if you sprinkle tiny numbers of a huge matrix and calculate the, 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 the density matrix squared and take the trace, it can still give you one. And that is very nicely described in these two papers um, with the archive references uh, given to you here. So let me give you our solution now that we have all the, the tools together. So we're going to revisit Mature's formulation using our um, insights. We start from the black hole. So that's psi i, and it's a sum of cn over the ge <laughs> geometry that depend on en, as I've argued. And we're going to emit the first quantum, r1. So as I emit the first, or well, the black hole emits the first quantum, the energy of the black hole shrinks a little bit by the delta. And the amplitude for the emission of this quanta depends on the original energy of the black hole times, um, sorry, not times, uh, but uh, and the quantum numbers of the particles, the particles that is emitted. So then I have a second emission. So the same picture, the, the first quanta moves away. You emit the second one and you change your state. Now it's G en minus delta one minus delta two. So that accounts for the shrinkage of energy of the black hole because you've emitted the second quanta, R1, R2. You have the amplitude for the emission of the first state. And the amplitude now depends on the reduced energy En minus delta one, because that's what you had after emitting the first quantum, R2. And then after n states, you end up with this object. So you have a sum of n, you sum it with all the quantum numbers, obviously. I may have forgot to mention it here or here already. You have Cn, alpha of the first emission, alpha of the second emission, alpha of the third emission, and so on. And you have your final state here that I had described to you earlier. Now, this point, the black hole has evaporated, so I'm not writing the geometry explicitly anymore. It's gone. It's basically flat space time. I've just rewritten this expression. In... <laughs> Sorry. Let me just rewrite this of the expression we had on the previous page here. So we can discuss it. So I've emitted the geometry G because my black hole is gone. It doesn't exist anymore. There's no horizon and space terms are approximately flat. Now, this object is really interesting because the final state, the final radiation state is a complex proposition that depends linearly on the initial black hole state. And on the time reversal, the radiation state evolves back to the original black hole quantum state. So that's a unitary evolution. So the fact that we have a quantum hair, so that it allows the initial state of the black hole to be reflected in the coefficient Cn and alpha, and it will affect the Hawking radiation. So again, this result is manifestly unitary, and the, it's clearly a pure state. So for each initial state that's given by Cn, there's a final state that is different, radiation state that is different, the time reverse evolution of this final, final radiation state results in a specific initial state. So that is what we call a macroscopic position. And I'll emphasize that in the next two slides because I think that's really an important thing to, to keep in mind. So we have the quantum hair gives us a mechanism by which the amplitudes alpha E comma R will depend on the internal state. And I think this is the first time that we have a consistent picture of how the information is encoded into the Hawking radiation. And again, for many people, if you if you're a string theorist and you um, believe in holography, it's not a big surprise that information is stored somewhere. But this is the first time that there's an explicit way to to make this connection and explain how information is encoded in the radiation. Yes, so 
yeah, basically, um, I have told you these things already. I'm sorry, I'm just repeating things. So I'm gonna, I can skip this slide essentially. Um, we, it's the, the amplitude will depend on the spins of the particles and so on. So everything is there basically. Right, so let me really stress one point that is crucial. The big difference between what I've shown you now, just now, and mature is the fact that I cannot write my state in a factorized form this way because of the alphas. So the, the tiny corrections are crucial because they forbid you to write your form as a tensor product. Any time you want to show that you, your information is violated or that you have a firewall or you, you have to make an assumption that you can factorize a state. But if you do things carefully, this is not going to happen. So that's why information cannot be uh, lost and why the evaporation must be <laughs> must be unitary. Okay, so let me emphasize a point that I think is crucial. I've talked about the macroscopic superposition. So every time you emit a pair of particle, or your black hole emits a pair of, of particle, your geometry, your quantum geometry is going to change, obviously. But the, the, there are also macroscopic changes. So by the time you have emitted, so you should not just consider one Penrose diagram, but by the time you have emitted all the particles, your black hole has moved a lot. So let me schematically, you would have a picture like this. So you have your black hole, there's a recoil, energy conservation basically. You know? So you emit particles in one way, your black hole has a recoil, and there's no reason why they should be homogeneous. So by the time your, your black hole has shrunk massively and essentially evaporated, you have moved macroscopically your your black hole has moved macroscopically and you and that's something that uh, page understood very well when he calculated this page curve that's part of his paper there so you have distinct geometries not just quantum one but macroscopic one and you need to, to sum up all these things and the way people thinking about the hockey paradox thus far was usually to, to stick to one um, Penrose diagram, which is not the case. Your Penrose diagram changes with time and H emission. And again, your, your object, your black hole is moving macroscopically. And you have to sum up all these geometries. And that, that's why things are working out, basically. Why do you have this macroscopic superposition? And that's the way out to, to, to make sense of these paradox. Now, okay, I will be quite quick with this last point. I've um, told you we could use EFT techniques to revisit Hawking's original calculation. Now, there, there's always a bit of a tricky choice to make when you're talking about a, a black hole and quantum gravity corrections. What do you take? Do you take Schwarzschild black hole and look at corrections? Or do you take a collapsing model? It depends a bit what you want to, to call a black hole. So a real astrophysical black hole obviously is not in vacuum. But I mean, for the sake of it, let's take um, Schwarzschild uh, solution because that's what Hawking used. And in that specific case, I, again, it's not a really good model for uh, an astrophysical black hole. I would prefer to use what we did, namely the collapsing model. But if you take Schwarzschild, you know that the corrections are going to be a third order in curvature. So that's something we've uh, done some time ago. And I'm just going to focus for the sake of principle to the local one. So you have this local operate or contribution that corrects the Schwarzschild solution. And those other corrections were obtained in that case. Now, with this, you can basically revisit the, the calculation that Hawking did some 50 years ago. You look at the scalar field, you decompose the creation and annihilation operators in the background. Um, so he had done that in the Schwarzschild background. We did that in our corrected background. And you can calculate um, the amplitude using the Bogulia Bogov uh, trick, basically. And what you find is that the amplitudes alpha and beta are corrected by the the quantum hair, basically, the corrections to, to the metric we're getting. So um, that um, is interesting because it tells you that the amplitude depends really on, or the radiation really depends on the um, corrections to the metric, and it really 
in a perturbative way, in the EFT way, allows you again to re-express the, um, you know, the, the understanding we had, namely that the information escapes the the black hole through the um, amplitude that information is encoded there. Now, the original calculation of Hawking doesn't make use of um, energy conservation. If you want to do this, you can use a trick by Perik and we'll check, which is a tuning method uh, to reproduce the um, Hawking uh, radiation. Um, what you do here is calculate the um, imaginary part of the action for um, you know, you, a system of, so basically again, a particle that moves um, it, through the tunnels um, through, through the system. And I will spare you the calculation of details. It's not very complicated. Again, it's a matter of a couple of pages of uh, you know paper. You find that the imaginary part of the action is uh, given by this. So that's, sorry, there's the E minus 2M, which is the result of um, Peric and will check. So that's going to be a deviation already from your thermal spectrum. We get the correction from coronal gravity here. And when we calculate the tuning rate, um, that's the Peric and will check uh, result. And we get this correction from coronal gravity. So when we look at the emission spectrum, basically, we see that we have this contribution from quantum gravity. Now, taking both the energy conservation and quantum gravity, we see that the, the, the emission spectrum differs from that of a black body. Um, so um, basically, it's a sign again that uh, radiation is um, non-thermal and contains information. Again, those are argument space or simple calculations uh, based on uh, EFTs, but you are in a regime where they are perfectly applicable where the curvature is weak. And um, so you can trust your results. So that in a way it uh, shows you how in a simple model, we could calculate the alphas that I was discussing with you uh, just 10 minutes ago when I was showing you the unitary evolution of the black holes. So, um, yeah, let me come to the conclusions. So um, we have now very well established methods to do calculations on gravity. And I really want to stress that uh, these calculations are model independent. Um, we don't have to know anything about quantum gravity. Um, the only real assumption is that GR is the correct low energy limit. Um, so we, for all practical purposes in our universe, um, the curvature is weak enough to be able to apply these methods. Um, you can match this EFT um, FEG of action to string theory or any other quantum gravity model you like. So if you're lucky, in a sense, your observables may depend only on the part that is uh, coming back from the non-local part of the action and thus um, fully model independent. And you have a real prediction of quantum gravity that is model independent of, I mean, doesn't, de doesn't depend on the UV completion. So I've shown you how to apply these, uh, these methods to, to stars and collapsing uh, objects. And um, basically hopefully convince you that black holes, um, that there's information about the black holes outside of the, the stars or sorry, outside of the black holes. And that's what we call the quantum hair. And then we went into a generic expression for the quantum state of the graviton state. And I've used these results to reconsider black hole radiation and evolution. And I've shown you that this process is actually unitary. And then finally, I've shown you how we could go back to these EFT uh, methods and use them to calculate uh, quantum corrections to Hawking's amplitude and spectrum. And we found a deviation from the black body spectrum. Thanks a lot for your attention. Thanks, Xavier. That was an interesting talk. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, so just to help people get uh, a bit of intuition about what's going on here, um, let's if we start for a moment thinking about a large, massive, isolated black hole, um, and we're well away from the Schwarzschild radius outside the, the a black hole, um, the the thermal radiance or the, the the radiance from the black hole is well approximated by a thermal thermal distribution, a, a Bose-Einstein distribution. Um, but there is encoded on that 
due to your due to your your um, quantum and gravitational corrections, um, the, already at that point we have information embedded in that uh, radiation because it's not exactly thermal. Is that correct? One way to look at it, yes. So yeah. basically, um, trying to build up a uh, some intuition. Yeah. So for, uh, there for, are exactly. So I mean, it's, it's clear that in the limit where you tune off quantum gravity, you would recover. Hawking's result in the CFT methods because we know GR is a correct energy limit. Yeah. So, but we do find that there are corrections. And again, you you know, the argument is well, if if I had just talked to you about EFT, you would be rightly asking me, but can you show that all information is encoded there? Yeah. And the answer to that is with the general arguments I've given you, it must be. And the EFT is just useful to give us intuition of what's happening and how the corrections are encoded. Yes. But the, the generic argument is the unitary evaporation. And that's the argument that, you know, basically all the information is released. Now, if you wanted to try to catch me, the only thing you could try to argue is that, oh, but at the final moment of your evaporation, your black hole has reached Planck mass. Yeah, exactly. You must know what happens to quantum gravity. Yes, that's true. But by that time, all the information is gone, essentially. Has it? Yes, so that's what these uh, these equations show us. Yeah. So you know the last very little bit, so be it. It could be a remnant, it could be whatever. We don't care. Um. So that that's the, you know, the only <clears throat> thing you could try, but it doesn't work. <laughs> yeah. So so roughly, uh, at what um, at what mass does that transition start to occur? Ah, so about? that's something you can do. So you can start to calculate corrections to the to the thermodynamics of uh, black holes. Yeah. And there are two things that are interesting in that calculation. One is that there is some a term that resembles a pressure that appears. Ah, that was my next question, actually, whether there was a, any sign of a pressure term. Yeah. Yeah, so you get that. And it's, it's a purely um, quantum gravitational effect. And it depends only on the non-local part of the action. So it's a prediction. And secondly, um, you can get the temperature and you ask yourself, when do corrections of order one occur um, to, to Hawking's result? And you see that it's for black hole masses that are um, under 10 times the Planck mass. Oh, okay. So as long as you're above 10 times the Planck mass, oh. the corrections are tiny. So it's got to be very small before we start. Oh, exactly. So it's really the final bit where you have to be worried about... Uh, oh. Okay, that's interesting. So you know that's that's the reason why these EFT methods are so powerful. Yeah, it's because they're really applicable over all practical for all practical purposes. I would say even inflation, we know that it's going to happen sometimes. You know, sub below the Planck scale by at least a little bit. That's enough to give you confidence that what you're doing uh, is meaningful there. So for all practical purposes in our universe, we have a theory of quantum gravity that works well. Uh, yes, it's, it's, it's not it's, it's speculative. It's yeah, yeah, it's lovely. So on your slide 20, um, in terms of the amplitudes alpha, could, you, you did talk about this, um, <laughs> but I just lost a bit of, I just lost track of, now how do we calculate the alphas again? The well, okay, so alpha amplitudes. is basically going to depend on two parameters. Yeah. There's the energy of the black hole. Yeah. And there's are the quantum numbers of the particle you emit. R1. And R2. R1 in the first phase, then R2, R2 and so on. R Rm, yes. <clears throat> so if you want an explicit calculation, that's what I've shown you in the last stage of the, the talk. Right. We could calculate. But I mean, you generically, you don't even care so much about the form of the amplitude. The main thing is that they depend. So, you know, alpha the, for the second emission depends on the energy of the first one. Right. So the emission of the third one is going to depend on delta one, delta two. So you can't really separate this term. And that's really what matters. You mm. can't write it as a tensor product. Yeah, I see. And that, that's a crux. And I don't even have to calculate explicitly the alphas here. Because of these properties, you cannot factorize your state. And you are and you you have this unitary evolution because of the shape of the state. Right. Right. Okay. And Murray had a question. He wanted to know if we just say a bit more on how significant the deviation is from the black body spectrum. 
Well, again, these are tiny deviations. And that's why I told you, you would ask me from, if I had just shown you this paper, hmm. you would have told me correctly, well, how do you know that all the information is gone? Hmm. Yeah. And I'd be embarrassed to answer that question. So the, the hmm. tiny corrections, but again, the, the, what you have to realize is that you have very tiny corrections, but you're summing over a huge number of states. And that's the argument that is really so powerful. If your Hilbert space is very large and you can convince yourself very quickly that it's going to grow with E to the S yeah. because of all the, the background geometry, the macroscopic geometry, all the states you're summing over, that compensates for the E to the minus S. Right. And that's the beauty of these two papers I was um, mentioning to you earlier here. So that's the key thing. A small number can be compensated if you sum over it a lot. Yeah. Okay. Right. And is there anything, I think this is my last question. I'm going to think of dozens of questions after I finish talking. <laughs> but, uh, I'm happy to answer that many times. <laughs> is there anything, I, I was listening to this paper, this talk, and I was wondering if there was anything related to or, or which implies the existence of EPR type correlations between the particles or antiparticles on either side of the Schwarzschild radius. Does that enter into this picture any uh, anywhere? Uh, not that I'm aware of. No, okay. The, the, the what motivates that question is if you go back to the um, work by Davies and Unruh on um, uh, accelerated observers. Um, in and that can be this can be done in flat in flat space times. Of course, you can calculate the um, the thermal radiance. The Davies Unruh formula is the same as the Hawking formula upon substitution of the of the uh, um, of um, uh, for the um, surface gravity of the black hole, effectively. And at, when you do that calculation, the um, Precise thermal distribution of the of the radiation is thought to result from the existence of an EPR-like correlation between particles in the right Rindler wedge uh, mm -hmm. to antiparticles in the left Rindler wedge, or vice versa. So then yeah. I was thinking to myself, well, you know, by the strong equivalence principle, there might be some way to port that picture across to this these types of calculations, which is what motivated my my question. That's a good question, but I, I, I haven't thought about it this way. Yeah, okay. It would be worth uh, thinking about it, yeah, thanks. Yeah, worth maybe worth doing a paper. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think that's all the questions we have. Um, Xavier, thank you very much for a really stimulating talk. Um, it's going to, it, it, I'm sure it will incite more, more, more uh, questions as time goes on and a lot of conversations in the tea room. So uh, thank you very much for that. And well, thank um, you for having thanks me. Every... <laughs> th Any thank... question emerges later on, please feel free to get in touch. Uh, I'll be thanks. very happy. Yeah, okay, excellent. Thanks a lot. Well, thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you, Xavier. And uh, we will keep everyone informed as to when the next talk is coming along. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. All the best and have a good evening. Bye-bye.